Around the world, a jigsaw puzzle of life and death lies in pieces. It is a story written in the blood of young people, defending a country, a cause, an ideal. Some lived to return safely home, and some did not. Others disappeared. On a brisk autumn morning in upstate New York, the earth yields the victims of a savage world war waged more than 200 years ago. Half a world away, dense jungle guards secrets of soldiers gone but not forgotten. Today, a new breed of forensic detectives pieces together their terrible final hours in ways never before possible. How these people lived and died is written in their bones. After long years of lying silent, they begin to tell these soldiers' stories. As the ancients have said, the war is not over as long as the last slain soldier remains unburied. Although the unknown soldiers that lie here are in fact buried, no families were ever notified, no loved ones ever appeared by the grave. Who these people were, the pain and fear they suffered, how they died, all these mysteries are sealed forever beneath impenetrable marble slabs. Today, thanks to modern science, no one in the United States military need ever again become an unknown. During Operation Desert Storm in 1990, for the first time in history, the identity of two servicemen was established by extracting DNA from their shattered remains and matching it against the DNA of living relatives, a costly and difficult process. Now, to more easily trace the names of war casualties, blood is taken at recruitment to predetermine each person's DNA pattern, as unique as their fingerprints. DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, is the blueprint of life. The chemical essence of genes, it exists in all cells of the body and carries the information for eye color, race, height, and other traits. Today, the technology to decipher DNA is so precise that recruits go off to war with a kind of genetic dog tag on file with the government. Hundreds of samples a year arrive at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology outside Washington, D.C. Hi, sir. How are you? Fine. The laboratory, which is the largest of its type in the world, processes and stores the genetic material. A computer checks name and social security number and prints labels for each packet. Maintained under tight security, the data may not be released except by court order. More than a million samples are already placed in deep freeze, each representing a unique human being. Deputy Program Manager is James Kanick. For those who have ever visited Arlington or any military cemetery, uh, probably one of the most moving things is to uh, see a grave that doesn't have a, no a name on it. And of course the inscription uh, reads, uh, Here lies in honored glory an American service member known but to God. And we hope that in our little operation that we have here, that we will preclude that from ever happening again. The first major war in which Americans fought and died was more than a decade before the War of Independence. The tranquil region, now known as Lake George, New York, was the scene of some of history's bloodiest fighting. In 
In 1754, France and England clashed in a mighty struggle for control of North America. The brutal French and Indian War raged for nine years and spread to every country where Britain and France had territorial interests. It has been called the first true world war. By 1763, with the French thoroughly defeated, the English ruled most of North America, including the 13 colonies. A strategic British outpost during the war was Fort William Henry. In the 1950s, the site was developed as a tourist attraction. Excavations of the old fort guided architects during reconstruction. While digging, scientists stumbled on an undisturbed burial ground. Today, a team of anthropologists and volunteers begin to piece together the story of how these soldiers lived and died. What they unearthed is one of the most gruesome stories in the annals of war. Forensic anthropologist Mariah Liston first began working with the Fort William Henry burials in 1993. Her colleague, Brenda Baker, has worked with her since the beginning of the project. Liston and Baker know from patterns in the earth that they are guaranteed to find burials here. This is the outline of one of the rectangular grave shafts. It extends from that corner to the head would be right here. We can tell it's a grave shaft because the disturbed soil from digging this hole has been thrown back in and we get this mottled coloration that contrasts very strongly with the undisturbed sand in this area. Over the course of 10 days, mounting excitement is tempered by the patience and precision for which every anthropologist is trained. As they carefully remove the earth within the grave shafts, the top of a skull finally emerges. I think this is really one of the most exciting parts of this because this is the first time this person has been seen since he was laid to rest. And you get an idea as you uncover his face of something about what he looked like and, and who he was. Slowly, the extent of the find becomes evident. Remarkably, the skeleton seems intact. When we first discover something new, some specific bit of information we haven't had before, um, it's exciting to have another piece of the picture um, and to know that we're, we're filling out the puzzle a little bit more with each of these discoveries. So I often wonder what happened to their families. Did the families ever learn that these men had died or what they died from um, and who they left behind? Uh, many of them probably had wives and children um, in other places. They're all pretty young. They're as young as about 14 or 15, up to early 20s, most of them. Um, a few that are a little bit older, but they're, they're late teens and early 20s. Before the skeleton is removed for right. preservation and study, Liston carefully documents its exact position. Even now, she begins to recognize the telltale signs of a vicious war etched in these bones. It looks like this is one of the soldiers that has been doing a lot of really heavy labor. There's a lot of wear and tear on all of his joints. The muscles in his back had torn from the soldier's bones under the constant stress of carrying heavy loads, and his ribs became fused to the vertebrae. He must have been in constant pain. If left exposed to the elements, the bones would deteriorate over time. Working well into the night, the team removes and labels each bone fragment to take to the lab. I'm suspicious about this break in the back of the skull. It looks like something that may have happened while the bone was still fresh. It could easily be what killed it. As the fragile skull is pulled from the earth, the bones crumble. The skull apparently was crushed by the weight of the soil. What a shame. 
fix this bad fracture here on the bottom too that comes across and gets you know that as well. But we may be able to see something a little bit more clearly when we get that all cleaned up. Two small buttons are found with the skeleton. They appear to be military, but the team can't be sure until they have been removed. One was found in the pelvic cavity of the skeleton, and the other seems to be attached to an unidentified material. And it looks like it's attached to either leather or it may very well be part of his skin. Copper often preserves organic tissue very well. American militia fought alongside the British at Fort William Henry. Items like buttons and fabric may provide clues to rank and nationality. Painstaking work, cleaning, sorting, and documenting the remains will take more than a dozen people weeks to complete. So this is probably where this other, this other button, these two were down, they dropped down into the pelvic cavity, and this one was right up on top of the hip socket. Some artifacts found with the bodies can be identified. Others remain a mystery. But many of the pieces in this detective story finally begin to take form. Far more than a pile of bones, a young soldier has emerged from the depths with a story he waited centuries to tell. So those two, those two. Two weeks into the excavation, as winter closes in, one complete burial has been unearthed, and several others are still being excavated. The team's task now is to try to read the life history that is written in the bones. The first thing that we can do is take a look at the skull and some of the features on the skull that indicate he's a male. If you look at the area over his eye orbits, you see that it's fairly well developed and there are brow ridges essentially there. And that's a feature that you find in men. Women's foreheads tend to be a little bit higher. This one slopes back a bit, so that's an indication that this is a man. This is his jaw, his lower jaw, and you can see it's very large and robust, and his chin is extremely square, and this is another feature of a male. Next, they must determine the person's age at death. And if you look at the ends of his bones and his arms and legs, you can see that they're completely fused together. In younger individuals, you would see separate caps at the ends of the bones, and because those caps have fused on, we know that he's at least more than about 18 years old. We can see that his molars are all completely erupted here, including his wisdom tooth, and that usually erupts when you're about 18 to 21 years old. So again, another indicator that he's an adult male. Many other questions remain. What was life at Fort William Henry like for this man? What was the condition of his health? Most of the younger individuals had very severe arthritis. The only place where he has any significant arthritis is here in his right elbow. And this is the forearm. Uh, this is the bone where it hooks over your upper arm and allows you to move it back and forth like that. And if you compare the right elbow to the left elbow, you can see how much rougher this surface is here on the right. So this means he had a lot more action in his right arm, and because of the arthritis showing up just in his right elbow, it suggests that he's a right-handed man. We have another clue that he was right-handed because he's got wear on some of his teeth, on his lower jaw, and you can see it's beveled right on these cusp surfaces here. So he's probably clenching a pipe over on the, the left side of his jaw and that's what would have caused that kind of strange wear pattern on his lower teeth. And because he was clenching that on the left side of his jaw, he was probably right-handed. You would put the pipe in the left side of your mouth and use your left hand to take the pipe in and out. The French and Indian War was fierce and long. Yet the soldier's most constant enemy was not a bullet, but disease. Smallpox, influenza, and tuberculosis ran rampant. This group of skeletons is more sickly um, in worse shape than anything I've ever worked with. Um, I've looked at people as old as about 3,000 years old and modern 
more modern populations as well, and yet this is the most diseased group. They've got the most injuries. Um, all the way around, there's more pathology here than anything. Although more soldiers died from disease than war-related injuries, the battle picture that emerges becomes increasingly grim. This soldier is an example of one that was shot. There's this depression that caused the bone to be crushed here, and another one at the top of the bone here. You can actually see the rounded depression of the musket ball. A lot of the soldiers that we found died from blows to the head. Here, something struck the soldier and punctured the bone, forcing fragments inside the skull and also fracturing it here down toward his eye and also running back toward the back of the skull. Diaries reveal that as the French attacked Fort William Henry, the British simply surrendered, too sick with smallpox to fight back. Then, without warning, a group of Indians allied to the French attacked and slaughtered the ill and injured men. The event was central to the novel The Last of the Mohicans, long thought to be an exaggerated account. If anything, it turns out, it was an understatement. Studying these skeletons, we have found extensive evidence of this massacre, um, documenting the fact that atrocities were committed. Um, we know that there were mutilations and massacres on both sides. As part of this war, everyone was participating in this. This soldier was one that was beheaded, and we have the account of a French priest who saw the beginning of the massacre, describing one of the native allies of the French coming out of the casemates were the hospitals at the fort and carrying the head of his victim. Buried underneath the floor of the casemates, there was a mass grave of massacre victims, and this individual was indeed beheaded. In the neck bone that we have here, there are a number of cuts slicing across the bone and a final one all the way through the bone here across the top. And so we're fairly certain that this is the individual that was beheaded that the priest saw. The bones found inside the fort tell the story of the quick and ferocious attack. As part of the massacre, part of the picture we've been able to reconstruct is that there were mutilations on the body, and this included genital mutilations. There are cuts on the front of the pelvis um, in the area of the genitals. Um, in addition, we think some of the individuals were disemboweled, and there are cuts going all the way through the region of the stomach and abdomen into the backbone uh, behind the abdomen. And we have here a number of, of cut marks and damage to the bone from that incident. Today, forensic science reveals much about the hardships with which these young men lived, the horrors they suffered, and the savage ways in which many died. It can create a picture of a soldier who was over 18 and right-handed, a man who smoked a pipe, which he probably held in his left hand, a strong man who spent his days doing a lot of heavy lifting, his arms and legs free of arthritis, but his back in constant pain. His bones and those of his fallen comrades tell us much about what these soldiers' lives were like. But we can never know their names. Forever anonymous, they belong to the ages. In 1861, Passions deeply felt over slavery brought the young American nation into a convulsive civil war. North against South, brother against brother, they fought for four bitter years. When the terrible trial by fire and sword came to an end, more than 600,000 boys and young men had died. The National Museum of Health and Medicine in Washington, D.C., was established in 1862 for record keeping and follow up care of the wounded. Here, Paul Sledzik has studied more than 2,000 bones of Civil War casualties. Although bone may appear rock solid, in actuality, it changes over one's lifetime, even over the course of a few days in response to exercise, wear and tear, and disease. 
bone is like any other organ system in the body. It's constantly replenishing its cells and changing the, the cells uh, within it. One of the changes that we can pick up in the bone that's interesting um, because it gets at what activities that the soldiers were doing are these changes in the upper part of the humerus. This is the humerus or the upper arm bone from a Civil War soldier and this defect here, this etched area in the bone is indicative of heavy muscle activity of the upper arm, probably lifting the 15 to 20 pound rifles and firing them, digging with picks and, and axes. The bones also tell of the savagery of battle. Although the wire was added later, this piece of shot was lodged in this man's leg for perhaps two months before he died. These three cranial sections show very well how bone response following trauma. This is, this is a skull section, an entrance wound going to the inner part of the skull. And if we look around the fracture margin, uh, there's no bony growth, and we know this man died as a result of this injury. This man lived for a month with this cranial injury. You can see there's some discoloration around the corners of the fracture margin here. If we look on the interior part of the skull, you also have some deposition of new bones called uh, periosteal reaction. You can see some of the gray uh, appearance here. This is a new bone that's being laid down uh, during the healing and or infection process. And then if we advance the time even further and go to a similar injury in the, in the cranium, this man lived for 10 years with this injury, a shot fracture injury. You can see there's been um, very good healing occurring around, around the site. Changes in the bones show the effects of one of the soldier's deadliest enemies, infection. This is the upper leg bone of Private Julius Fabre, who was wounded at Deep Bottom, Virginia, on the 16th of August in 1864. He was shot just above the knee, the knee would be here, and his limb was amputated uh, the following day on the 17th of August. He lived for six years with this, uh, with this uh, femur becoming infected. You can see the change that's occurred. Let me show you a normal femur for comparison. You can see the amount of infection that has set in on this bone. Later, Fabre required more extensive surgery as the infection spread toward his hip. For archival purposes, the museum routinely photographed amputees alongside their severed limbs. The first extensive medical encyclopedia on military casualties was made possible by these Civil War survivors. But it would take another major war before scientists could begin to put names to soldiers who had died. December 7th, 1941. In the pre-dawn light, Japanese bombers appear out of nowhere. Sirens shriek, bombs explode. Pearl Harbor is destroyed. America is at war. Ironically, a war that took millions of lives would become the greatest boon to the fledgling science of forensic anthropology. World War II was the first war for which our service members had documented health records. By matching skeletal remains against known medical information, Scientists were able to gather enough anatomical statistics to understand the life history each of us has written in our bones. During World War II and Korea, we had the first opportunity as a science to really look at some good documented modern samples and develop some new techniques for determining stature and age on, on these men uh, that were killed during the war. Since we knew who, who they were, they were positively identified, we could measure the length of a femur or a long bone and plug that into the stature regression formula or make new stature regression formula from that. Now, with a simple wooden board and a set of mathematical equations, anthropologists could begin to piece together profiles of the dead. This bone is 323 millimeters long, and if we plug that into our stature formula, our regression formula for stature, uh, we know this is a, a white male. Uh, we come up with an estimate of about 67 and a half inches, uh, plus or minus an inch on either side. That would be the stature estimate for this individual. But 
there are nearly 90,000 Americans from World War II, Korea, and Vietnam whose whereabouts are still unknown. Some of their remains have been recovered but not yet named. Other soldiers exist only as charred and shattered fragments hidden in remote jungles. But these men and women are far from forgotten. The search for their identity is one of the great detective stories in forensic science. More than two and a half million Americans served in the Vietnam War, the longest war in American history. 58,000 died at an average age of 19. Boys are barely out of high school. The ferocious guerrilla combat mangled and mutilated bodies, often beyond recognition. The remains of over 2,100 of these young men never made it back to the United States. Many of the men were buried upon impact at crash sites in the jungles, or their bones lay undiscovered in the foliage, decomposing from the intense, moist, tropical heat. After nearly 20 years in the military, 38-year-old Air Force Major Edward M. Hudgens was preparing to retire when he was sent to Southeast Asia in 1969. At home in Big Spring, Texas, he left behind his wife Mary and their four children, Stacy, Wendy, Jeff, and Doug. On March 21, 1970, seven months into his tour, Major Hudgens was leading a search and rescue mission flying over Laos when his A-1 aircraft was hit by intense enemy fire. Other pilots saw his plane go into an inverted spin and crash, but they saw no parachute and heard no emergency beeper signals. There was never any uncertainty as to uh, my husband's death. Uh, the uncertainty was not knowing when they were going to bring him back. All we could do was wait and wait for the government to get permission to go in. They were supposed to go into the site one time about two years ago, and we were all excited about it. And then um, there was a change in plans, and they could not go in. And I, uh, I was absolutely devastated. It just tore me apart, and I didn't realize how much I had counted on that. Mary Hudgens has never remarried. Using her VA benefits, she went back to school, got a job, and raised her four children alone. When other kids my age have lost a parent, they have a cemetery and a grave site they can go to and they can commune with their parent, their lost one. We didn't have that. Hope for the Hudgens family lies thousands of miles away where scientists they had never met worked to find Ed Hudgens and bring him home. Hawaii's National Cemetery is known as the Punch Bowl. The stairs are flanked by stone walls etched with the names of thousands of soldiers who disappeared in combat, beginning with the Second World War. Nearby, at Hickam Air Force Base, the U.S. Army's Central Identification Laboratory, Hawaii, Seal High for short, is one of the world's leading institutions in forensic science. The soldiers and civilians who work here have pledged that the unaccounted for are not to be forgotten. Currently, over 78,000 men and women are missing or unaccounted for from World War II, 8,100 from Korea, and 2,154 from the Vietnam War. Deputy Commander of Seal High is retired Colonel Johnny Webb. Okay, as we prepare to go out to sites to recover service members lost in previous wars, a lot of work has to be accomplished before the teams can actually go out and begin the recovery operations. 
plain metal shelves hold thousands of files. In each folder are the medical and dental records of soldiers missing from the Vietnam War. Today, much of the information has been transferred into a massive computer database. The real research is done in this room to prepare our teams to go out and do the excavations as well as to provide the information to the scientific staff to make the individual identifications. Before Seal High sends an excavation team into the field, they study the reports from the casualty data section for each missing soldier. They then research any information gathered from outside sources. Eyewitness reports from local villagers who may have found a plane crash or people conducting oil or timber exploration can prove invaluable in pinpointing the exact location where a soldier was last seen. Seal High recovery teams train in Hawaii before excavations begin abroad. A mock demonstration site simulates an A6 series aircraft crash with meticulous detail. Uh, here we have a lot of pin flags, different colors, yellow designating wreckage, red designating unexploded ordnance or bombs, and the blue is designating any life support material, uh, things that the pilot was wearing at the time of the incident. A 12 by 16 meter area is laid out in 4 by 4 meter units, so the team can document where each artifact is found. Dirt is carefully removed and brought to a sifting station, where it is sorted by hand through a fine mesh screen. The smallest fragment might make the difference in finding a soldier's name. The team is looking for anything that can be identified, either from the aircraft or personnel, bones, ID tags, or pieces of a life support system. Metal detectors scour the site in hopes of finding scraps from the plane. In the field, the detectors are vitally important as they also help locate any live ammunition still on the site. Mostly coral, just this band of red. Ground penetrating radar sends radio waves into the earth which reflect off buried objects. Disturbance close to the surface. The surface profile has been disturbed recently. Okay, we have an anomaly. We have metal objects. Different types of materials create colored bands, which helps the team assess the likelihood of a burial. The first dramatic use is that when we go to Southeast Asia and, we're, and we have these witnesses to incidents that occurred in the 60s, these people are apt to be old. And what they do, they say, well, yes, I did bury him, I did bury the American, and I buried him somewhere around here, but it's changed. And then they might point to an area, it's a football field in size, you know? Maybe the body's there, maybe it isn't. But I can eliminate vast areas of it within minutes. After weeks and months of training, men and technology are put to the test in a once forbidden land. The jungles of Vietnam that claimed its victims more than two decades ago. The Central Identification Laboratory sends teams all over the world to find the remains of service members who are missing or unaccounted for. Working in some of the world's most remote locations, the teams work tirelessly to ensure that they recover every piece of evidence. But two decades after the Vietnam War, crash sites are far from intact. Villagers have scavenged whatever they could find a use for. 
This piece of wreckage from a downed American airplane is being used as a blade for a plow. And now that plow may be hundreds of miles from where the plane actually went down. Seal High teams work closely with local villagers who might remember the crash or may have discovered some wreckage. The goal? To try to pinpoint the exact location of the crash. She said she, she saw 13 people. She personally counted 13 people uh, that morning. The team compares the information they receive from the villagers with detailed maps prepared at Seal High to determine the coordinates of the probable crash site. Global positioning systems fix their exact position as they trek sometimes for miles toward the site. Right dead on it, right in the middle of it. Once the excavation is set up, work begins to find and clear the area of any ammunition. The work requires patience right. and precision and can be extremely Good. dangerous. Beauty! Okay, move on back. Live 40 millimeter shells litter this C-130 crash site. Once they are located, they have to be carefully removed and carried to a safe distance where they will be disposed of later. Clues at the crash site come in different shapes and sizes. When a plane crashes, artifacts and remains bear the unmistakable scars of the 600 mile per hour impact. Large guns are buried by the force of the crash. The plane is literally torn apart. Pieces of the fuselage are scattered in all directions. It's a helmet. Microphone is something. Flyer's helmet. Deep in the jungle, another Seal High scouting team uncovers a button from a flight suit. Then, further digging reveals a remnant of fabric from the suit beneath the dense jungle foliage. In a high-tech war, soldiers are mangled by their machines. Finding an intact skeleton in Vietnam would be inconceivable. So every fragment is a vital clue. The most significant finds are human bones and teeth. All the remains found in Vietnam are brought back to the Seal High Laboratory in Hawaii for analysis. Sometimes, all the forensic scientists have to work with are mere fragments. From these, they must piece together whether they are human, and if so, the individual's age, race, height, weight, and ultimately, their name. To date, Seal High has positively identified 570 unaccounted for service members from World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, and returned the remains to their families. Often, bones arrive with no clear idea of where they came from, Identifying those remains is Seal High's most difficult task. Many times, several portions of a skeleton arrive at Seal High, each reported to be the remains of the same missing serviceman. Seal High anthropologists must try to identify each fragment of bone and determine who it belonged to. When bones cannot be identified by the standard methods, Seal High turns to DNA testing to analyze the remains but the test won't work on small bone samples. I will tell you that this is the only bone fragment on the table that is large enough and in a good enough state of preservation, we think, to yield DNA. Before the bone can be tested, a sample must be cut and measured. Mitochondrial DNA will be extracted from the bone sample 
and compared to that of a living maternal relative. Okay. What do you think, five grams? Five grams. We're going to send this sample to AFTL, and in about four weeks, they should issue a report to us on whether or not they were able, they were able to sequence mitochondrial DNA out of this sample. Before any work begins at the Armed Forces DNA Identification Laboratory outside Washington, D.C., the bone sample must be catalogued and photographed. In the laboratory, before the process of extracting its DNA can begin, the exterior surface of the bone sample is cleaned to remove any contaminants. Then, a two-gram fragment is washed, dried, and pulverized in a blender. The powder then undergoes a chemical reaction that disrupts the cells and releases the DNA into a liquid solution. This incubates overnight with an enzyme which breaks up the proteins within the cells, leaving purified DNA. Mitch Holland is the branch chief of service and genetics systems. Uh, DNA fingerprinting is just like a, a fingerprint. Uh, what we do is we look along the sequence of the DNA, we analyze those regions, uh, we compare those regions to, say, a suspect, a family member. When we do that comparison, we're looking for inclusions and exclusions. We're looking for matches and non-matches. Scientists at the Armed Forces Lab have a twofold job, to identify DNA fingerprints from blood samples and the more complicated task of extracting DNA from remains which may be decades old. In order to match the DNA fingerprint of a missing soldier, the scientists must test it against a blood sample which has been mailed to the institute by a maternal relative. The process of extracting DNA from old skeletal remains is such a significant advance in biological science that in 1993, one of its creators, Dr. Carey Mullis, earned a Nobel Prize. Scientists had known of DNA since the 19th century, but the mysterious nucleic acid structure was not known until the 20th century. In 1962, James Watson and Francis Crick won the Nobel Prize for uncovering DNA's three-dimensional molecular structure. There are two types of DNA, nuclear DNA, which is found only in the cell's nucleus, and mitochondrial DNA, found in the surrounding mitochondria. The first type is not as plentiful as the second, which can endure in bones for thousands of years after death. In both varieties, DNA resembles a twisting ladder with cross rungs composed of adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, or A, T, G, and C for short. The prints in DNA fingerprinting are pieces of A, T, G, and C of varying lengths and arrangements. Mitochondrial DNA is inherited only from the mother. Therefore, people related along maternal lines share identical patterns in their A's, C's, G's, and T's that non-related people probably would not. A match indicates a high probability of identification, but in and of itself is not 100% conclusive. To have a large enough sample to work with, scientists are able to reproduce or copy the DNA in a machine called a thermocycler, which synthesizes millions of exact copies of the DNA within a few hours. The process is known as a polymerase chain reaction. The sample is then carefully loaded onto a gel through which an electric current is passed. Ultraviolet light helps visualize the individual bars of DNA. Then, several samples are loaded onto what is known as a sequencing gel, one sample per lane. The sample is then read by a laser, which runs back and forth across it several hundred times a minute. The information is then converted into a peak, which can be translated into an A, G, T, or C. When compared to the family reference sample, 
If the sequences are identical, they are considered a probable match. Over the years, remains alleged to be those of Ed Hudgens came to Seal High four times. Once from an unknown source, once from a Laotian native, and twice from his known crash site. The bone tested for DNA was from the Laotian source and was clearly ruled out by the lab tests. But some of the bones acquired from the unknown source aligned with fragments from the crash site. These can be certified as belonging to Hudgens. Artifacts at the site found near Ed's remains included his watch, a buckle from his seat harness, a dog tag chain, and a dime, an American coin deep in a faraway jungle. But it would be a single tooth, not much bigger than the dime he carried in his pocket, which provided the pivotal clue the scientists sought. When the cases come into the Seal High laboratory, if there are dental remains, they are studied by forensic odontologists. They look for any unique characteristics which would help match the tooth to a missing soldier. In this tooth, we see a root canal. In other words, the tooth uh, had the insides removed and was filled with paste. Uh, and that matches very closely with what we see in the post-mortem x-rays. Other fillings that are easy to match are these single fillings on the lower teeth, here and here, as well as this series of fillings on the upper teeth. And so this is a good example of when we have enough evidence to work with, both anti-mortem and post-mortem, about how closely we can match the dental records. Teeth are x-rayed, and the information is directly input into a huge database of dental records. This represents the post-mortem image that we just took on the tooth. All the dental records of people missing from Southeast Asia and Korea are kept on file. The forensic odontologist enters the specific details of the tooth that has been found into the computer begins to make a match by checking the tooth against the information in the records. This patient had fillings on a couple of teeth in the top right side. The computer checks the characteristics of this single tooth against the thousands of records in its memory. Each time it eliminates a record, it moves closer to finding a match. The forensic odontologist enters more information and the computer eliminates all but four records. This tooth could belong to one of four missing men. One more piece of information remains. This molar had a small filling in the bottom right quadrant. This information eliminates all the records but one. The team has made a match. Can you take this down to casualty data and tell them that we have a uh, pretty good hit on Catme and I'd like to take a look at the record? Yes, sir. Thanks. Only a few hundred bone fragments, most less than half an inch in size, and one tooth can be said with certainty to belong to Ed Hudgens. For the family, it is enough. Whether transporting tiny, unidentified bone fragments from an excavation site to a lab in Hawaii, or finally sending a soldier with a name home to his loved ones, Seal High treats all remains with utmost respect. Arlington National Cemetery, the ritual is repeated every hour, 365 days of the year. Fallen heroes forever honored, yet forever unnamed and unknown. But one hero, once among the missing, has finally been found. He comes to eternal rest with a name, full military honors, and a purple heart.
For Mary Hudgens and her children, Ed Hudgens' journey cannot be measured in years or calculated in miles. He lay in the jungle for 26 years, and we now have put him to rest and with honors, and his, his uh, fellow countrymen have honored him, and it brings it to a conclusion for us. Twenty-six years to the day after Ed Hudgens' plane crashed in the jungles of Southeast Asia, his children lay a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknowns. In Fairfax County, Virginia, police find a decomposed body, but have no report of a crime. In Fort Myers, Florida, a killer confesses to a grisly crime, but the police cannot find a body. A serial killer may go free unless police find the evidence to put him behind bars. In each case, forensic scientists must find proof of the crime in the bones of the murder victim. Using scientific studies of human decay to find out when the victim died so the killer may be traced. Hoping to prove there is no perfect crime. That dead men do talk. December 1993. In a wooded area near Washington, D.C., a surveyor has made a gruesome discovery. While mapping out a new suburb in the Virginia countryside, he has stumbled on a body buried in a shallow grave. Officers from the Fairfax County Police Department arrive at the secluded area where the body had been found. The first homicide detective on the scene is Detective Jerry Farrell. How you doing, Officer Gregory? What do you got? Got a human skull right over here. Okay. Take a look. The police assume it's a homicide. But there are no immediate clues to help identify the victim. And Lieutenant Wilson, he's there. You want to take a look? What you're going to need is uh, start mapping out the area. Secure this area okay. here, and then we're going to need at least 50-foot area perimeter set up around this one. Yes, sir. The team of investigators will search a wide area. Scavengers have dragged parts of the body away. The police meticulously document the position of the body with photographs, sketches, and notes. Detective Dennis Wilson heads the cold case squad, investigating crimes where the trail of evidence has gone cold. In such cases, every clue, every piece of evidence, no matter how small, may be the key to solving the crime. From bits of clothing and hair, detectives Wilson and Farrell are fairly sure the victim is a woman. Since decomposition often leaves fatty residues, 
the officers take soil samples near the body. Chemical analysis could help determine when the victim was buried. Well, you only have one chance at a crime scene, and you have to do it right the first time. So you slow things down at that point. There's no hurry. The body's obviously been there for some time. Uh, we're going to try to gather all the evidence we can and make sure we don't miss anything. There just may be one small little clue here that's going to lead to either her identity or the identity of the perpetrator. Because the body is so badly decomposed, the detectives make a call to nearby Washington, D.C. Dr. Douglas Owsley of the Smithsonian Institution is an anthropologist whose specialty is identifying human remains, from soldiers who died in the Civil War to the modern-day victims of homicide. He has testified in many criminal trials as a forensic scientist. Forensic meaning science used as proof in a court of law. Receiving the call from the Fairfax County Police, he agrees to visit the site where the skeleton has been found. In the usual case, murder victims are assigned to medical examiners who dissect the body to find the cause of death. But medical examiners are accustomed to dealing with fresh bodies. Here, only bones are left to tell the tale, requiring the special skills of the anthropologist. It takes three days of careful excavation to take the body from the ground. Back in his laboratory, Owsley hunts for signs of the victim's age, sex, and the manner of death. It is immediately apparent that the victim is female. The pelvic bone is wider in females to accommodate childbirth. Though Owsley believes the victim was a young adult, it's difficult to be more precise. She does not show any signs of arthritis, not, not uh, severe arthritis. If you look at her spinal column, there's only minor changes, no development of arthritis. Her pubic bones are showing a stage of maturity that would be consistent with somebody that is about 30 years of age. In a young person, the sutures of the skull are plainly visible. As a person grows older, the sutures tend to fuse together. In the victim's skull, the sutures are starting to disappear, confirming that the victim was a young adult. Only five feet, one inch tall, she'd been stabbed repeatedly the knife blade leaving marks on the collarbone, ribs, and vertebrae. Looking at the pattern of cuts in the bone, you can tell that the individual was, was behind her at least some of the time. Uh, she has knife wounds that penetrated in, in the back and the midline. Uh, the cut that is in the, in the clavicle and the collarbone there's many different positions that could account for that, but one would be the individual reaching over her. Attaching a name to the body will not be easy. To shed more light on this mysterious case, police must determine the identity of the victim. In Fort Myers, Florida, police will have the opposite problem a crime without a body. 911, what is your emergency? Yeah. Okay, one moment, sir. Betty, I have a man on the phone advised he just murdered someone. In a police communication center in Fort Myers, Florida, a 911 call will lead to the discovery of a grisly crime dating to 1989. 911, what is your emergency? I'd like to report a homicide on Piney Road. A uh, murder? Where did it happen? I'm only calling in because I should confess that's what I did. And you did it? Yeah. The caller reports a murder he has recently committed. Why did you do that? I don't know. He says he's thought of turning himself in, but hasn't decided yet. Are you going to wait there for us? The 911 call is traced to a shopping center phone booth. 
the operator tries to keep the killer on the line while a message goes out to police units in the area. Lee County 2, 11, 1, 1065, a possible signal 5 at Coral Gate Shopping Center. Or Orange Grove in Pondella. Orange Grove in Pondella. Officer Paul Rose monitors the call and finds no one at the shopping center phone booth where the call originated. But less than a mile from the shopping center, he has spotted a possible suspect. The suspect had been walking hurriedly at the side of the road, away from the direction of the shopping center. The suspect, whose name is Paul Klein, quickly admits he made the 911 call confessing murder. He is advised of his rights and taken into custody. The previous night, he'd broken into a house and strangled an elderly woman on the couch where she lay. There is no sign of anything missing. Robbery had not been the motive. Lieutenant Jeff Taylor, entering the house, found the victim just as Klein had described her. But he would soon find out that she had not been Klein's first victim. Klein related to me that he heard voices, and the voices made him become angry. And every time he became angry, he had to kill someone. And when he said that, it indicated to me that perhaps there were other victims also. And I asked him at that time uh, if he had killed before. And he said yes, twice. Klein had murdered one other woman in a trailer some months before. But his first victim had been a friend named Danny Webster, killed a year and a half earlier in August 1989. Luring Webster into a field to look for aluminum cans, Klein had beaten him to death with a lead pipe. A crime scene search unit scours the area where the killing allegedly occurred. Here you go, I got something over here. Oh yeah? What is it? Does it look like it's been there a while, or? We had information that we believed at the time that um, the crime was committed, the, the original act of the homicide was committed in this field. So what we did, we did a grid search of this whole field, and upon doing that, we located a shoe. Uh, it's early to tell right now if it actually belongs to the victim, but we believe there's a good possibility that it does. Therefore, once we found the, uh, the shoe, we have to treat it as evidence. According to Klein's confession, he had returned to the scene of the crime three days after the murder. Arriving at night to avoid detection, he swam with the body to a marshy swamp island, where he dismembered the corpse with an ax and a paring knife. After disposing of Webster's body so thoroughly and getting away with his crime for a year and a half, Klein has now decided to confess. The crime scene search officers find a small piece of bone, photographed exactly where it is found. But they will not find a body. Without a body, police do not have enough evidence to convict. Detective Jack Shell interrogated Klein under tight security. Klein had once bent a stop sign with his bare hands. We needed a positive identification of the body. Although we had somebody telling us who they killed and that they killed them, we still have to prove who was killed, how they were killed, and when they were killed to the best we can. It's the corpus delecti, the body of the crime. 
we have to be able to establish that yes, this person died and that this person did it. I guess I must have actually hit him about, I don't know, maybe more than 200 times. I'm not sure. I just kept whacking at everything. I hit him in the legs, the arms, everywhere I could get his face. I, this is head region was more where I actually hit more than anything. But uh, that was after he was already dead, too. You know, I just kept hitting him. Klein's confession by itself is not enough to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. The police must find the body. Klein pointed out the marshy island where he says he left the dismembered corpse. But even if police can find it, it will be hard to identify after a year and a half in the swamp. The case will go to Dr. William Maples of the University of Florida, a world-renowned authority on the identification of skeletal remains. In 1991, he led the team that exhumed the bones of President Zachary Taylor, who died mysteriously in 1850. Some historians say Taylor was poisoned, making him, not Abraham Lincoln, the first American president to be assassinated. After testing the dead president's hair and fingernails for poison, Dr. Maples laid the body and the assassin theories to rest. In the case of Paul Klein, it is immediately clear to Maples he is dealing with a possible psychopath totally unaffected by death. Well, bodies in Florida tend to bloat very rapidly. Florida is known for its sunshine and good weather, especially in the area of Fort Myers where this took place. Uh, so the first thing that our uh, killer attempted to use was a paring knife. Uh, it is very flexible, it is light, it may be sharp, it may be uh, serrated, and may be very, very effective sometimes in cutting up bones. The, the so-called Ginzu steak knife is amazingly flexible and yet will go right through bone if it's properly used. Uh, so our killer sticks the knife into this bloated body and out pours all over him yellow and green discharge, foul-smelling fluid. Uh, this is enough to, to really disturb anyone, even if they, they weren't disturbed to start with. But the killer's use of a paring knife may be the key to identifying the victim's remains and corroborating Klein's confession. If we take a paring knife and rub uh, along a stick or a bone, or whatever the case might be, you notice that the blade jumps and chatters. Uh, this chatter produces a, an interrupted type of cutting on the bone surface. And we look for this evidence of chattering, and that tells us how flexible or inflexible the blade is. On the other hand, if we take a good heavy bladed sharp knife and cut on the bone. It doesn't chatter, it simply shaves the bone. And this is evidence of a heavier, less flexible blade. Crime scene search officers arrive at the island where Klein left the dismembered body. If they can find bones that were sliced with a paring knife, they'll have strong proof that Klein's confession is real. Hey, Chris. How you doing? You're gonna earn this one. You're gonna earn this one. Klein was to have accompanied the officers himself, but in the boat going over to the island, he'd been much too excited at the prospect of seeing his victim's remains. For their own safety, the officers decided to search without Klein's assistance. It's a serious mission, for unlike his other crimes, the murder of Danny Webster was vicious enough to send Klein to Florida's electric chair, or else prove beyond all doubt he's a dangerous psychopath to be put away indefinitely. 
he seemed like a normal person. Uh, you didn't notice any psychological problems or anything, but the more it went on and the more I realized he was telling me the truth and that these gory facts he was telling me really did happen, then I'm beginning to think, you know, we've got a, got a real weirdo here that can do this and talk about it so calmly and so intelligently. Klein had a nickname he didn't like. Because his arms extended out from his body as he walked, kids made fun of him, calling him Popeye. He'd killed Danny Webster for calling him names, repeating time after time it was because Webster had harassed him. How are you feeling? Uh, I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, everything's all right. I just uh, have to go ahead and, I don't know, I think I feel almost a little dizzy for that matter. I have to eat a little bit of something, take my medication. Is that person yeah. in the marsh, Danny Webster? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yep, that's him. Or that that was did, him. Why did uh, you kill him? Uh, he was always being cruel and, I don't know, calling me names and stuff. And I decided Please to go for it. Okay. Watch your head, Hey, thank you, ma'am. I appreciate everything. Watch your The island where Klein left the body is partially submerged and subject to changing tides. The logistics of finding evidence are very difficult. Finally, more bones are found. The body is in pieces, just as Klein had said. I asked him, how did you take this body apart? I believe his response was just like I always do. I took off the left leg, the left arm, the head, the right arm, the right leg, in a circular motion like that. And he had used a hatchet, axe. He told me where the axe was, which was in another state. Him and his father had went to uh, their home in another state and left it there before he came back. Pieces of bone found on the marshy island are sent to the FBI for examination. The FBI confirms that the bones show evidence of hatchet trauma. An axe or hatchet had been used to cut the body apart. But according to his harrowing confession, Klein had reserved special treatment for the victim's head. Yeah, yep, got his head off with the parry knife and, and uh, the head. Uh, there was more or less like in pieces and I tossed it right on an embankment about 25, 30 feet from the mangroves. And I stuck it there for like, uh, see, I had it there for like the longest time, I guess something like three and a half months. He told me that he would, he took the head and kept it to come back and visit it. He would visit it every night and talk to it. And after about two weeks, it got to the point where it was deteriorated to the extent that he didn't want it anymore, so he discarded it. Klein had carried the head around with him in a paper sack, often engaging it in conversation. Spotting a police car on one occasion, he panicked and threw the head into a waterway but he could not remember where. A police dive team searches the area where Klein may have discarded Danny Webster's skull. It is an area of murky waters frequented by alligators. They find nothing but coconuts. Unless the head is found, it may be impossible to identify the remains as those of Danny Webster. Here, as in suburban Virginia, the police must team up with science to bring a killer to justice. At the Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C., tourists gaze at the wonders of the natural world. They are unaware that a few feet away, a storage area holds the unnatural work of a vicious killer. 
Police in Fairfax County, Virginia, have called on forensic scientist Doug Owsley to help identify the victim of a brutal homicide. The body has decomposed. Only a skeleton remains. Owsley has determined that the victim was a female from 27 to 34 years old. She died from repeated stab wounds. But who is she and where did she come from? When you're, when you're working with police cases and working on problems of human identification, often when the remains come into the laboratory or when you're involved in the recovery, the identification follows very quickly. There's someone that's missing, there are records that can be obtained, dental records or medical records that you can compare against and you can get that person identified within a very short period of time. But police uh, well, in Fairfax well, County have found no immediate links to a missing person. What's your phone number? Owsley will need every piece of evidence he can find to produce a life history of the victim, to be matched, hopefully, with someone who disappeared as many as six years before. Personal effects found with the victim are minimal. An inexpensive hair clip, a hair pick. Her blue jeans had rotted away. Her synthetic underwear remained. Lightweight sandals indicate that the crime was committed in warm weather. Her hair was a light brown color, as, as determined from analysis of hair found at the, at, the, at the site. We know that her fingernails were painted from fingernails that were recovered at the site. Uh, it was a, a dark, glossy pink in color. So there's a lot of details. On the earrings found near the body is a fragment of human tissue. The metal of the earring had protected it from bacterial decay. The earrings are included in sketches distributed nationwide. Slowly, painfully, the haunting details of the victim's life are coming into focus. In the spinal column are signs of trauma. Depressions in the vertebra are evidence that the discs between the vertebrae have herniated. The victim may have held a job that required heavy lifting. She'd once taken care of her teeth, but in the last years of her life had allowed them to decay. She had fillings on the front teeth to maintain her appearance, but five of her molars are missing. Black stains on the teeth are evidence the victim was probably a smoker. Overall, the, the impression that you would have, but it's an impression based not only on the dentition, but perhaps some of the things found with it, it, it would suggest that it was an individual that, that did not have a lot of money, that uh, fairly, fairly limited financial resources. The information gleaned by Owsley is passed on to the Fairfax County Police Department, where Detective Bruce Guth heads the homicide branch. In, in our jurisdiction, uh, many of the murders are um, committed by people who know, know the victim. In the normal case, once the victim yeah, is known, the police will talk to neighbors and relatives about the victim's lifestyle, who her friends were, and her enemies. A chain of evidence often will lead to the guilty party. In this case, we don't know the identity, so it makes it difficult to to uh, really go much further till we know who it is. Detail by detail, Fairfax County Police re-examine the evidence found at the scene. A sketch of what the victim may have looked like is distributed to police across the country, along with other details of the case. Even though this case is two years old, I'm still actively pursuing leads that have occurred. I receive inquiries approximately two to three a month. Uh, just recently, I received one from Philadelphia, New York City, and Ohio. Uh, Despite the continuing efforts of the Fairfax County Police, there is no matchup of the murder victim with a missing person. To facilitate the search for the victim's identity, Doug Owsley provides data for a second composite sketch using an FBI computer program. When you, when you look at a skull 
and you're trying to assess what this individual looked like, the basic form is going to be defined by the skull itself. In relation to that, then you take into consideration the clothing that's found, for instance, because the clothing helps you, you gain a, an idea as to the size, the weight of the individual, for instance. Starting with an image of the skull, the computer adds successive layers of detail. Markers indicate the probable thickness of facial tissue. The measurements are based on population studies of similar age and gender. Hair found at the scene, along with the plastic hair clip and hair pick, suggest a possible hairstyle. The victim had an overbite, a gap in her front teeth, and a cosmetic filling. Since these features would have been visible in life, the victim is shown smiling in the final illustration. But despite the pains taken to create a lifelike image, there is still no response when the image is published nationwide. Part of the problem, the police are still unsure when the murder occurred. When discovered in 1993, the bones had been dry. The flesh had long since rotted away. You'd have to say that it would be at least a year and a half before that that this could have happened, but in reality, I think it could extend back further in time. And so if we take the, the maximum range, one of the things found in a pocket was a quarter that dates to 1980. So looking at the time frame, we're, we're in terms of the extremes, probably talking between 1991 and 1980. The problem of dating murder victims found long after the crime has occurred may soon have an answer. At a body farm in Tennessee, an unusual study is underway using the volunteered flesh and bones of the dead. In Fairfax County, Virginia, police continue their search for clues to identify a woman found in the Washington suburbs. In Fort Myers, Florida, a confessed serial killer has led police to a headless body, barely identifiable as human. In both cases, work done at the Tennessee Anthropology Research Facility, or TARF, will prove invaluable. Its director is Dr. William Bass, a forensic anthropologist at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. His expertise is the human skeleton. Individual who'd been dead about 10 days, found out on the edge of the river. When a person is recently dead, Morphological features such as prints on the fingers and palms can help with identification. When these features are gone and only the bones remain, the case is one for forensic anthropology. Bass's facility receives on average one body a week for identification. Parts of Tennessee have become a dumping ground for murder victims. We don't think of the interstates as being avenues of crime, but they're absolute avenues of crime. So you can kidnap somebody in Chicago. You can come down I-75, which comes down through Cincinnati, through Lexington, Kentucky, into Tennessee. The first real area that you get to on I-75 going toward Florida that is really rural is Tennessee. And we get a lot of bodies thrown out there. With so many bodies, Bass has invented a boxing system for storage. Every skeleton gets his own box. So we, uh, you want to box them because if you don't, they will get lost, they will get dirty. On the shelves surrounding him are over 2,000 skeletons sent to Bass's facility by medical examiners around the state. With the help of graduate students, Bass assists the police in determining the sex, race, and other identifying characteristics of unclaimed bodies. But in doing his work, Bass became acutely aware there were no reliable statistics on rates of human decay. He established near Knoxville an outdoor preserve known informally as the Body Farm. Here, he has planted not living things, but dead. Mm -hmm. 
human bodies left in the open to decompose. It's an experiment that will tell him how bodily decomposition is affected by weather, climate, and the degree of exposure to the elements. This is a body that we're studying uh, the effects of, of the covering of the body that the maggots leave. This body has been outside for a year. Maggots have eaten its inside away, but left some of the skin for protection. Maggots don't like sunlight, and uh, what they do is they leave this as an umbrella to protect themselves from the sun. And so you get bodies like this um, that will have the covering on them holding the bones together, um, although there are no internal organs left there at all. The specimens used for Bass's experiments come from two basic sources those who have donated their bodies to science and unclaimed bodies sent to the facility by medical examiners. After the bodies have lain in the open to decompose, they are brought back to the laboratory for analysis. Dissection will tell how their exposure to the elements has affected their skin, bones, and tissue. These statistics will then aid police departments in determining how long a newly discovered homicide victim has been dead. To keep out intruders with morbid curiosities, security guards keep the body farm under tight surveillance. Bass has attempted to duplicate all the common ways in which killers dispose of their victims. Well, we try to keep as honest a setting as we can. Uh, we try not to make anything artificial. It's, it's exactly the way it is in nature. What we have here is an, is an automobile that we have been looking at the decay rates of people in automobiles, both in the passenger compartment and in the trunk. A body placed in the trunk for observation has since been removed, but its byproducts remain. Tiny pupil cases from which flies have emerged. A matter of minutes after death has occurred, flies are attracted to the body to lay their eggs. The eggs will hatch into larvae, or maggots, that feed on the decaying flesh before turning into flies. We can tell you that this individual has been in this trunk at least 21 days from the fly pupae that are, are present, from the pupal cases that are, are present here. In the back seat of the car, another body has been removed, yep. again leaving a clue as to time of death. Hair mass. What's called the hair mass falls off a dead body after a week's time. Bass has found that in enclosed vehicles, the buildup of heat often accelerates the process of decomposition. Some of the bodies have been dead only a week. Well, he hadn't gone very far. Well, well, they're both at about the same stage, aren't they? On that body. Others are much older. Well, there are there are some maggots right there, but that maggot is frozen. Uh, he's gotten away from the warmth of the body and uh, didn't make it back to the body, so. There are a couple right there. I'm going to push this back just a little bit more here, and uh, we'll see if we can't get under there. And I'm not really sure. Well, you see, there are lots of maggots. See, there are hundreds and hundreds of maggots in there, uh, and they are either slowed down. They're not. They're not doing much right now because it's so cold. Each month, Bass sends bone and hair samples to the FBI for analysis. The samples come from a number of different specimens in a variety of locales within the farm. The FBI will study how time, exposure to the elements, and the environment in which a body is found may alter its DNA. 
you can do DNA analysis on the maggots and they will produce the same DNA. If the individual has, um, has been on drugs, the maggots will pick up those drugs. You can tell from analysis of the maggot. Also, the volatile fatty acids, which are that, the goo that you see there, those are what are called the volatile fatty acids that leach out of bodies. Now, we've been able to take this material and analyze that and determine the length of time since death up to about two years. In other parts of the facility, bodies lie in coffins above ground. Drainage tubes allow the testing of fluids and air samples without opening the coffin lid. This is Nearby, bodies are buried in coffins six coffin. feet underground with a culvert allowing access. Here, Bass and his associates study how subterranean burial affects the rate of decay. Since killers have been known to dismember their victims and scatter them around, another area is set aside for body parts. It is not always an exact science. But Dr. Bass's work, the first of its kind, will help the police with murder victims found long after the crime. In the case of Danny Webster in Florida, police have only part of the body. The killer has done a thorough job of dismembering and scattering the remains. Filling in the grisly details of murder and mutilation will be the job of forensic science. At the Lee County Sheriff's Office in Fort Myers, Florida, Paul Klein has confessed to the murder of Danny Webster but the killer has carved up the body and disposed of its head. The few bones found on a marshy island are a year and a half old. It may be impossible to prove beyond a reasonable doubt they are the bones of Danny Webster. We in, we come back out, so Klein had been relentless in attempting to conceal his crime. Before decapitating the body, he had pulled out the teeth, knowing they're often used to identify the victim. He explained that instead of digging a normal grave type hole, that he dug a round hole as if to put trash or something in it. He set the victim down in it, buttocks first, and shoved him into the hole by his shoulders. When he didn't go in all the way, he jumped up and down on the body until he was able to get it deep enough into the hole that he thought he had it hidden. Then he pulled weeds and dirt over it and laid on his belly and his words were slithered back into the water like a big gator and swam back home. Is Klein a psychopath or is he a man who has plotted and planned the perfect crime? Okay, a perfect crime. Let's think, how about Jimmy Hoffa? How far have we gotten on Jimmy Hoffa solving? We don't even know where he is. How can we solve the crime if we don't know where he is? You see, so somebody, I mean, somebody's already thought of this and said, so, you know, if you leave the body, it's a good chance you're gonna be caught because there's all these the hair and fiber sections of the FBI and the forensic anthropologists of the world all over. All my colleagues were out there trying to figure this out. But if you don't have a body, how do you know you've got a crime, you say? Detective that? Harry executed a search warrant at Klein's apartment. It was soon apparent Klein may have learned the techniques of killing from books. Um, we found uh, probably every true life murder story that was ever written, uh, like Son of Sam, uh, The Hillside Strangler. It was just book after book after book. From sparse remains, forensic science must identify the body of Danny Webster. If not, the case may be lost. In order to corroborate Klein's confession and make the case hold up in court, Anthropologist William Maples will try to determine the age, sex, and race of the partial skeleton. This is the shaft of the bone. This is the epiphysis, the end of the bone. And they start from separate origins in a child. Uh, and they slowly change shape. As the epiphyses reach the end of their growth, they become fused to the shafts of bone. On the bones in this case, fusion is not yet complete. Maples is able to put the age of the victim between 17 and 23, the same age as Danny Webster. 
Determining sex is almost always a matter of studying the pelvic bones, narrower in males than females. The victim in this case was clearly a male. But determining race will be more difficult, especially with the head missing. Dr. Maples uses the femur or thigh bone to distinguish Caucasian and black. In a Caucasian, the femur is bowed enough to allow his knuckle to pass under. In the case of a black individual, the shaft tends to be much flatter and straighter, and there is no anterior bowing. The amount of curvature in the femur clearly indicated to me that we were dealing with a white male. Finally, Maples examines the bones for evidence of the chatter marks that a paring knife would leave if used to dismember the body. Killers, by and large, aren't stupid enough to use paring knives. So we don't have a lot of evidence of that. But the results are positive. By the end of his examination, Maples has conclusive proof that the bones match the description of Danny Webster. The necessary corroboration of Klein's confession is in place. For Lieutenant time. Jeff Taylor, the case is closed. Um, Paul Klein is presently in um, an institution uh, in Chattahoochee, Florida, for um, uh, mentally insane. But in Fairfax County, Virginia, police have a tougher problem. A murder victim remains unidentified. A killer may go undetected, free to kill again. More than two years have passed since the discovery of a female body in the Virginia countryside near Washington, D.C. Fairfax County investigators, including detectives Jerry Farrell and Dennis Wilson, have sent out extensive information on the case including descriptions of the victim, dental charts, and a description of some, but not all, of the wounds discovered by forensic expert Doug Owsley. Persons have been known to confess crimes they did not commit, having learned the details of the crime from public sources. By withholding certain information, the police can be sure when a confession is fabricated or genuine. Right, this is gonna be the cut, right? Far from having a confession, police in Fairfax County, after two years of searching missing person files, still do not know who the victim is. Even today, we think a lot about her and, and are, are hoping that through the facial reproductions that have been done, that someone might be able to recognize her, might be able to contact the police and offer new insights, because this is, this is somebody that we need to get identified and we certainly need to, to, in order to hopefully prevent this from happening again, find out who did this. We've sent hundreds of leads out, hundreds of posters. Uh, we're going to probably revise this again at least once or twice a year. We try to cover it on the TV stations, the media. Uh, we try to get the uh, newspapers interested to run the picture. We run not only the artist renditions, but we also run pictures of the clothing. Uh, this is no way a case that's just sitting on a shelf and nothing being done. With a growing population and more and more people on the move, many crimes may never be solved. Victims like the one found in Fairfax County, her friends and relatives unaware of her death, may remain unidentified, her killer free to kill again. I think that uh, homicide investigations are getting a little more difficult. Uh, the national trend is more stranger on stranger murders, as in past years it was family members, domestic kind of murders. Uh, nationally, there's more stranger, stranger murders. And forensics becomes a very important part of the investigation. Was this the work of a serial killer? Doug Owsley believes not. The body was buried in haste, the killer lacking the tools to dismember it so it would never be found. Serial killers, like Florida's Paul Klein, are far more efficient. You don't gain necessarily that same sort of sophistication in this case. Certainly it led to a tragic end, but uh, in terms of accomplishing what he set out to do, he was, he was much less prepared. On the other hand, um, 
he was able to take someone's life and he's been able to get away with it all these years and so and so there's there's just some piece that we haven't uh, been able to put together to, to get on his trail yet. Despite the obstacles to solving the case, detectives in Fairfax County have not given up. Somebody sooner or later is going to talk about this. That's one of the premises of a cold case squad that relationships are changing and uh, technology's changing, technology. things are becoming more advanced. I'm optimistic that this case could get solved. It's, uh, we keep working at it, chipping away at it. Eventually, it's going to it's going to unfold. Oh yeah, I optimistic. Believe we're going to do it. Sometimes things just take a little bit longer. That's all. William Maples, for one, believes that few killers escape detection. No, no, of course not. They, they don't play by our rules. Uh, they, they will take chances, do things that we wouldn't do. Uh, they, they just don't play by the rules. And that's helpful to us because that means that they make a lot of mistakes. And by taking chances, they invariably end up getting caught. Thrill is a big element. Thrill means that they're taking chances. And God love them. The more chances they take, the more chances we have of catching them. Washington State, two people die agonizing deaths. Both are victims of poison-laced Excedrin capsules. The news causes public panic and costs manufacturers tens of millions of dollars. In Virginia, a cardiac care unit experiences an epidemic of unexpected deaths. Is this bad care or bad luck? Or is it something more sinister? and a man tries to murder his wife in an insurance fraud. Emergency. I, I've got a medical emergency. Well, my wife is, is going to some kind of convulsion. And she's now, she's, her mouth is foaming. Poisoners are among the most elusive killers. Today, forensic detectives are employing an arsenal of techniques to uncover and convict them. Who is winning the war? It is nine o'clock on a Saturday night when Dr. Joseph Whittle makes his final rounds. Whittle is co-director of the coronary care unit at General Hospital in Petersburg, Virginia. I'm Ms. Thomas. I'm Dr. Whittle. He has been on duty since noon. It is time to go home. Among his patients is Josephine Thomas, a 73-year-old retired teacher. She was admitted with heart problems several hours earlier and now is resting comfortably. At around 11 p.m., Whittle orders an IV. Thomas. 
The duty nurse signals a code blue, a patient emergency, and calls in Dr. Whittle. Josephine Thomas is in crisis. It takes Whittle just 15 minutes to return. Everyone clear? Shocking. Too late. Josephine Thomas cannot be revived. The death troubles the staff. An epidemic of unexpected deaths has struck the cardiac care unit in the past few weeks. Two nurses suspect that Josephine Thomas may not have died of natural causes. Their suspicions deepen an hour and a half later, when a package of lidocaine is found to be missing. Okay, lidocaine two gram? No. You don't find any two gram? Uh-uh, we didn't use a two gram. All right. Well, we should have one two-gram lidocaine in. I don't have one. Lidocaine is a drug given to stabilize heartbeat. In large concentrations, it can be fatal. Whenever a death seems unusual or suspicious, medical and law enforcement personnel are required to contact the medical examiner's office. Hi, Dr. Fierro, how are you? Hello, Jim, how Dr. Are you? Marcella Fierro is chief medical examiner for the state of Virginia. In her first year as an assistant medical examiner, she worked on the Petersburg case. The problem arose when it became apparent that there was one, an increased number of deaths in the unit as compared to previous months. And secondly, that a significant number of them were occurring in the presence of or were being discovered by Leroy Hargrave. Evening, ladies. Leroy Hargrave was a 21-year-old nurse's aide whose reputation around the hospital was decidedly mixed. It was Hargrave who had called the alert on Josephine Thomas. Several other deaths had also occurred during Hargrave's shifts. Was this coincidence or was something else going on? No one had seen Hargrave do anything wrong. It would take all the resources of forensic science to establish what had happened. Throughout the United States, an autopsy is performed whenever the cause of death is unknown. This unknown male was found dead on a Michigan street. All right, go ahead and uh, check the status of the hair, looking for any injuries on the head. How did the individual die? Was it natural death, an accident, a homicide or suicide? Sometimes the answer is undetermined. Did he make it to a hospital? No, not this guy. He was found dead in an older part of town. I'm wondering about lead poisoning. You think we ought to get a heavy metal screen on him? I think it'd be a good idea. Why don't we get some uh, head hair too? Right. Since arsenic can accumulate in the hair, if we do find arsenic on the general heavy metal screen, then we can uh, fractionate the hair since hair grows about one centimeter a month, uh, see if there's any chronicity to the uh, poisoning. Pathologists gather a variety of samples, including muscle tissue, brain, kidney, urine, and blood. About 30 cc's will be enough, Paul. Okay. All right, let's get a piece of kidney too, Paul. All right. Each sample may tell a story about the victim's life and death. Poisoning is a rare occurrence, according to James Valentour, head of the toxicology laboratory for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Poisoning is not automatically suspected. It depends on the circumstances or lack of other evidence following the investigation. If an autopsy is conducted on a young person in otherwise apparent good health and no cause of death is found, then the suspicion of drug involvement or drug contribution to that death increases, and we proportionally increase our analyses until we uh, rule out all the possibilities that we, that we can. Today, poison specialists called toxicologists employ a bewildering array of sophisticated technologies. Antibodies, protein substances the body produces to combat foreign matter, are used to detect toxins. To test for cocaine and its metabolic products, for example, 
blood is mixed with antibodies specific to certain parts of the cocaine molecule. A fluorescent label is added to the mixture. If cocaine is present, the pattern of fluorescence changes. To identify poison compounds, they must be broken down into smaller parts called ions. Dr. Valentour and his colleagues use the most powerful techniques available, which include the gas chromatograph and mass spectrometer, which are often used in combination. Chemicals are added to a sample to separate any organic drugs present from the blood matrix. The isolated portion is vaporized and passed along a hydrogen-filled tube. Molecules of different size migrate through the tube at different rates. As molecules emerge from the tube, their concentration is measured. Next, the mass spectrometer shatters the molecule into ions, its chemical building blocks. A complex molecule may generate hundreds of ion fragments. The pattern of ions produced is unique to a particular molecule. To identify the unknown substance, its ion signature is compared to those of tens of thousands of chemicals in the computer's database. In time, techniques like these would reveal not one, but six poisonings at Petersburg General Hospital. Logic Poison Center, can I help you? The world is filled with deadly chemicals. An average home harbors dozens of dangerous substances, such as chlorine bleach, drain opener, and aspirin, each capable of causing death. The Blodgett Regional Poison Center in Grand Rapids, Michigan, receives thousands of anxious phone calls each year. Many concern overdoses, accidental or intentional. Many more involve children who have eaten some bright berry or sampled the household bleach and a few involve deliberate attempts to kill. John Trestrail directs the center and is an authority on poisons and poisoners. Well, poisoning homicides differ from normal homicides in that there usually are no witnesses. There are no visible signs of trauma. You, you see no bullet holes, no stab wounds, no bruises. Usually it's very covert, very secret. Um, the evidence is usually lacking. There's no uh, cartridge cases or anything. Often it's missed, and this crime scene is cleaned up. Trestrail's office reveals a lifetime of fascination with things poisonous. Take, for example, um, spiders. We know that uh, this small spider, compared to one big spider here, you say, well, which one's more poisonous? Well, most little kids will say, obviously, the big one. Well, the tarantula is no more, no more worse than being stung by a bee. But the black widow is capable of killing. So size is not always associated with degree of deadliness. In Trestrail's view, mankind's knowledge of poisons is extremely ancient. In all likelihood, it goes back to making the connection between eating something and getting sick. Okay, here we have an example of what primitive man might have first associated cause and effect relationships with. Here is a mushroom called the fly agaric, common name. Amanita muscaria. And it contains chemicals that produce hallucinations and a lot of other bad garbage that go with it. But I'm sure at one time in prehistory, Man looked at someone eating this and said, what he, what he did when he ate this was it caused these symptoms. And from that, they said, this mushroom contains these poisons. I have this knowledge. This knowledge led to mystery and, and uh, the shadowy figures of the shamans and witch doctors and everything. So the whole history of toxicology began a couple of hundred thousand years ago. It was probably the third weapon developed after the stick and the stone, the poison. The essence of poisoning is stealth. To shoot or strangle a person, the murderer must be present. Poison offers the opportunity of long distance homicide. There is also the chance that homicide won't be recorded at all, that the death will be deemed due to natural causes. This is what had occurred at Petersburg General Hospital. 
until Josephine Thomas's death began to arouse suspicions. The first lady came in and was autopsied and was found to have serious heart disease, but she also had lethal concentrations of lidocaine in her blood and in her tissues, which she should not have had because she had no order for it in her chart, nor had she been given lidocaine during her code. Concerned about the rising death rate, the hospital reviewed all the fatalities since Leroy Hargrave had been assigned to the unit. And they identified 10 persons that they thought might be at risk for lidocaine poisoning. James Dalton, now a judge, was assistant Commonwealth's attorney in Petersburg when the deaths took place. I received a call from an attorney. He said, we've got a, a, something I hope doesn't exist, but I'm, I'm afraid that there's a possibility that there have been a number of people actually killed at the hospital. Dalton also learned the name of the chief suspect, Leroy Hargrave. They were on his shift, and he may have, his shift may have varied, but uh, he was, he moved around, so whenever he was on a shift, but it was a night shift normally that these occurred, and I guess it was not too suspicious initially because I think there is some history of people dying at night uh, more frequently. So far, the evidence was circumstantial. Hargrave happened to be around when the deaths took place. To convince Dalton, and ultimately a jury, that they were premeditated murders, the medical examiner had to show that the patients had been given lidocaine in unusual amounts. The task was made more difficult because several of the victims had been dead for several months. It was a toxicological masterpiece as far as detective work because they were, in one case they're working with fresh tissue. In other instances, they had to recover the poison from bodies which had been embalmed and buried. And in the third instance, they had to try and establish sufficient tissue levels in the biopsy samples from the previous autopsies. When it was all over, of those 10 deaths that were suspicious, six were established as due to acute lidocaine poisoning. Prosecutors piece together a likely scenario leading to Josephine Thomas's death. It begins with Hargrave stealing some lidocaine. Once the cardiac care unit has settled for the night, he slips into Thomas's room unobserved. After loading a hypodermic with a massive dose of lidocaine, he temporarily disables Thomas's cardiac monitor alarm. Within seconds of administering the drug, it will disrupt the rhythm of Thomas's heart, causing a fatal seizure. Then, Hargrave raises the alarm to divert suspicion from himself. We need some help in here. Leroy Hargrave was convicted of poisoning Josephine Thomas and sentenced to life imprisonment. He never confessed, and his motive for killing Thomas and the other patients was never established. Dr. Fierro talks about one theory. The code, the actual code procedure, the cardiac arrest procedure with the response by a, a resuscitation team is a very dramatic event. It's very intense, it's very rapid, there are orders, there's no pleases, there's no thank yous, there's just instructions. And this is quite exciting to persons who are on the outside, you know, if, if you're not related to the person who's being coded. So it was thought that he really got into the code. Without the initial suspicions of the nurses, without the technology to precisely identify lidocaine weeks or months after death, Leroy Hargrave might have gone free. John Trestrail. How many bodies do you dig up to find a bullet hole? None, they catch that before they're buried. How many bodies do you dig up to find a poison? Most of them, we're missing them at the point of death and we're burying the evidence. That's difficult to overcome, but that's what we're going to do. 
Among the most difficult poisonings to detect are those involving product tampering. In 1982, seven people in Chicago died from poison-laced Tylenol. A rash of copycat crimes followed, each with its own bizarre twist. June 11, 1986, mom? the town of Auburn, Washington. Hey, Mom. Fifteen-year-old Haley Snow finds her mother collapsed in the bathroom. Susan Snow is unconscious. Her pulse is weak. Her breaths come in long, irregular gasps. Haley dials 911. Within four hours, this apparently healthy 40-year-old mother of two will be declared dead. When paramedics arrive at Seattle's Harborview Medical Center, Susan Snow is comatose. Harborview is the best trauma center in the Northwest, but Snow is fading fast. Snow's condition puzzles the emergency team. Her brain appears swollen, inflamed. She is struggling for breath, and her vital signs are failing. She never recovers consciousness. An hour after admission, she is declared brain dead. What appeared at first as a random death soon will be revealed as murder. It will cost a pharmaceutical company tens of millions of dollars, incite public panic, and set off one of the largest law enforcement operations ever mounted in Washington state. Special agents Jack Cusack and Mike Byrne were part of the FBI investigation team. The first victim in this case was uh, Sue Snow. She was a 40-year-old bank teller that lived in Auburn, Washington. And um, in her daily routine, she always ingested uh, Excedrin. The cause of Susan Snow's death emerged almost by chance. At her autopsy, the assistant medical examiner noticed the smell of bitter almonds, a telltale sign of cyanide poisoning. Many people cannot detect the odor. By a quirk of genetics, the assistant medical examiner could. Dying by cyanide isn't pleasant. Inside each cell, cyanide displaces oxygen in the energy transport mechanism. Deprived of oxygen, cells collapse. The body dies, slowly asphyxiating, bit by bit. By June 16th, the cyanide source had been identified, the bottle of extra-strength Excedrin capsules in Susan Snow's kitchen. 750,000 bottles of Excedrin were immediately recalled or withdrawn. The news made headlines all over America. Fresh in everyone's minds were the Tylenol poisonings in Chicago. How many would die this time? To catch a poisoner, it helps to get inside his or her head. John Trestrail explains how poisoners target their victims. One is type S, S meaning specific victim. That victim has a name. They know exactly who it's going to be, whether it's their spouse or whether it's a political figure or somebody. They're going out after an individual with a name. The other type is type R, random victim. In other words, they know they're going to get somebody. They have no idea who it's going to be. And this is where you find your tamperers who are work, at work, either for ego or for industrial blackmail. And uh, sometimes you can actually find individuals cloaked and camouflaged as random poisoners that are specific. So this gets to be a real mind game, the investigation of this kind of an offender. Susan Snow's death, it would turn out, was a random killing. She was poisoned in a cold-blooded attempt to draw attention away from the real target. On June 5th, six days before Susan Snow died, Bruce Nickel had suddenly collapsed at his mobile home in Kent, Washington. When paramedics arrived, they found the 52-year-old Nickel on his back, gasping for breath. His face was cherry red, his body deathly pale. The paramedics had never seen such symptoms before. 
Nichols' wife, Stella, told them he had been complaining of headaches. Shortly before collapsing, he had taken two extra strength Excedrin capsules. Stella emphasized Excedrin over and over, the paramedics would remember later. She even retrieved the bottle from her kitchen. Evacuated to Harborview Medical Center in Seattle, Nickel died a few hours later. The autopsy recorded death from natural causes. Nickel had died from emphysema. Strangely enough, uh, Stella Nickel was also making a few additional calls on her own. She called her doctor. Are you sure this is what he died of? She called the paramedics. It, it could have been anything else. Uh, are you sure that you know he died of natural causes? She wasn't quite that obvious, but, but she did make these telephone calls. Stella called again after news of Susan Snow's poisoning appeared. The lot number of Snow's Excedrin matched the capsules Bruce had taken. Tests quickly proved that Nichols' capsules were laced with cyanide. Nichols' body had been buried, but a vial of his blood remained. It too was tested, again cyanide. Across the state, shelves were cleared of Excedrin. But of the thousands of bottles screened, only five were found to contain cyanide. A little quirky thing about that was, Stella had two of the bottles. And even more strange than that was, she said, hey, I bought one of the bottles about a month before Bruce died. And I bought the second bottle a little more than a week before he died. The odds of that are unbelievable. Stella's deadly plan began to unfold. First, she poisoned Bruce with cyanide-laced capsules. Then, to make his death appear a random killing, she placed more contaminated capsules on drugstore shelves. Investigators began searching for a motive. They soon found one, insurance fraud. When Bruce Nichols died, and he was found to have died of natural causes, Stella stood to gain approximately $31,000. If he died accidental death, then this jumped up to about $178,000. And in addition to that, she had a couple $20,000 policies. To insurance companies, dying by poison counts as accidental death. But had Bruce taken out the policies? Handwriting experts scrutinized his signatures, comparing them to Stella's. The height and width of a letter, its shape and slope, all contain telltale clues. So does the fluidity, the flow and rhythm of the writing, which is very hard to fake. Bruce had not signed the documents. Stella had. Could the investigators now tie Stella to the cyanide? When the capsules were shipped to the FBI's toxicology laboratory in Washington, D.C., an unexpected clue appeared. The white powder was contaminated with tiny green specks. The specks were 99% sodium chloride, ordinary table salt. Bulking out products with salt is a common manufacturing practice. But what of the remaining 1%? Laboratory analysis revealed four separate chemicals. Two were used almost exclusively in preparations called algicides. One commercial product contained all four of the chemicals. It came in the form of tablets, which were bright green. The laboratory called us back and said, we have positively identified those green crystals as a product known as algae destroyer. It's an algicide used in fish tanks by fish fanciers. And that, that really rang a bell for us because uh, from the first time any of our agents went in Stella's residence, it was obvious she was a fish fancier. She had fish aquariums all around the front room. The cyanide had led to algae destroyer. Would algae destroyer now lead to Stella? Agents combed pet stores all over Seattle someone might remember Stella and the kind of algicide she preferred. The search ended at a store not far from where Stella lived. It stocked algae destroyer. 
and the manager recognized a photograph of the woman who frequently bought it there. It was Stella Nickel. For months after Bruce Nichols' murder, Stella avoided taking a polygraph test. Her health would not permit it, she explained. In November 1986, she finally agreed to cooperate. The test is designed to pick up tiny physiological changes. Blood pressure and pulse rate are carefully monitored. Each may change when an individual lies. Forensic detectives use the polygraph to eliminate innocent individuals from their suspect list. That was not to be Stella's fate. I remember the comment she made when we were walking back to the examination room. And she kind of turned around and said, uh, I feel as though I'm walking into a lion's den. I didn't understand the significance of that comment, but I thought, mm, a little unusual. Stella took the, took the examination. I formulated the questions. They were clear cut. Um, did you cause your husband's death? Did you put potassium cyanide in those extra strength excedrin capsules? Stella clearly, clearly showed deception on the test. When we uh, informed her of that in straightforward fashion, she asked for her attorney who was in the waiting room and uh, basically uh, everybody knows how the Miranda rights go. That pretty much terminated that interview that day. More trouble was in store for Stella. This time it came from an unexpected source, her daughter, Cindy. When she heard Stella had failed the polygraph, she contacted Jack Cusack. You know, there's no doubt about it. We had a lot of good breaks come our way on this case. And uh, one that paid off in the, initially was the fact that uh, Stella's daughter, Cindy, decided to uh, share with us some of the conversations that she had had with her mother out at the airport. In 1985, after years of feuding, Stella and Cindy briefly reconciled. They even got jobs together as security guards at Seattle's SeaTac Airport. It was there, in the pauses between flights, that Cindy heard hints of Stella's plan. First, Stella asked her daughter where she might buy heroin, what was a lethal dose? How much cocaine? Then she talked about hiring a hitman to shoot Bruce while she was out of town, or, less plausibly, to kill him in an automobile crash. Finally, she talked about poisoning Bruce. You know, Cindy told us that, you know, my mother spent a lot of time doing research at the library. She said, my mother would go to the libraries within the Seattle area, within King County, and research various plants. At first, Stella hoped to identify poisonous plants on her property, which she could surreptitiously feed to Bruce. To check out Cindy's story, the FBI sent teams of agents to every library in South Kent County. It was a monumental task. They were searching for a book, any book, that would tie Stella to poison. Boxes of books were sent back to the FBI laboratory in Washington, D.C. There, a team of examiners scrutinized them for Stella's fingerprints. We're kind of part of the, the human behavior aspect of the case, and that's, a lot of ways, that's pretty interesting. You're in on the interviews, you're kind of putting the pieces of the puzzle together. A lot of the un, unsung heroes in this is the poor guy back in the FBI laboratory that gets a half a truckload of books and a set of fingerprints and said, find him in there. And he spends months and months and all of a sudden calls us up one day and says, hey, in this one book of the multitude of books you sent me, I found 104 of Stella's fingertips in there and I found three palm prints. And you can imagine when we're on the receiving end of a telephone call like that. The circle was closing on Stella. Special Agent Mike Byrne. So now we have library books that we went out, came up with her latent prints on library books where she actually researched cyanide. We had the insurance 
uh, where she forged uh, Bruce's signature, and now we have the algae destroy product that she actually purchased. On May 9, 1988, Stella Nickel was found guilty of murdering Bruce Nickel and Susan Snow. She was sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. She never buckled. When, when Jack had a chance to interview her, said, you failed the polygraph examination, it was just a stone face. And she never buckled. Even to this day, she's never, she's never said anything. No one saw Stella poison Bruce. She never even met Susan Snow. Still, she refuses to face her guilt. Denial may be a characteristic of poisoners. According to John Trestrail, imagination is another. We also find that poisoners are very intelligent, uh, certainly more so than the typical, typical brute-like uh, clubbing of an individual as a sophistication of the, of the weapon's delivery. We find they're very artistic. By artistic, I don't mean they paint pretty pictures, but I mean that they can design almost something like a play. Investigators believe Joe Meeling adopted Stella Nichols' scenario when he read about her story in Reader's Digest. The case begins on February 2nd, 1991, in Tumwater, Washington, 50 miles southwest of Stella Nichols' home. One evening, as the Meelings are preparing for bed, Joe reminds his wife Jennifer to take a Sudafed. Jennifer's snoring disturbs him, he claims. She must be congested. Jennifer does not feel congested, but under Joe's continued pressure, she agrees. A week earlier, Joe had purchased some Sudafed capsules. But why Sudafed, which they have never used, and why capsules? After Stella Nickel, Jennifer is wary of using them. Moments later, Jennifer collapses and rapidly becomes unconscious. Special Agent Tom Turgeson was involved with the FBI investigation. What happens when someone is poisoned by sodium cyanide was perhaps best described by Joe Mealing himself when he called the 911 operator and described to the operator what was happening to his wife. Well, my wife is going to some kind of convulsion. What's Second that? Avenue South. Yes, 1111, Second Avenue South, number two. Has she ever had a, pro a no, seizure she's before? No, she's never had a problem before. Never. How old is she? She's 29, 28. She called me from the other room, and she's now, she's, her mouth is foaming. Take a deep breath. You need to be calm for your wife, okay? Yes, I'm calm. Okay, does she use drugs or on any medication of any kind? She just took a Sudafed. It was fast, it was swift, and, and she was in agony. Rushed to the emergency room, Jennifer is in a coma. The staff struggles to save her life, treating Jennifer for diabetic ketoacidosis, elevated acid and blood sugar levels. In the midst of it all, Joe Meeling makes a curious suggestion to the physician in charge. Have you considered poison, cyanide in particular? Miraculously, Jennifer recovers. She tells the emergency room doctor that she had taken Sudafed at her husband's insistence. The doctor alerts the police and orders a cyanide test. Next day, his suspicions are confirmed. There is cyanide in Jennifer's blood. Without Joe Meeling's comments about cyanide, Jennifer Meeling's poisoning might have been overlooked, just as Bruce Nichols' poisoning initially was missed. But why don't toxicology laboratories routinely screen for cyanide? Washington State toxicologist, Dr. Barry Logan. It's relatively uncommon to uncover a, a, an unsuspected poisoning. Uh, usually if an investigation has been done properly by the uh, investigator's office, by the coroner's office, uh, we have information up front about what uh, the circumstances are surrounding the death, so we know whether it's likely to be a poisoning or not. Dozens of compounds show up on routine drug screening tests. Cyanide does not. And there is a further complication. Prior tests for cyanide have uh, taken a long time to do. 
and uh, it's been difficult to, to, to generate the results in a, a way in which the, the information can be used effectively by the investigators. Before 1991, detecting cyanide involved a multi-step test which took at least a day to complete. Every sample of tissue or blood had to be tested separately. Dr. Logan has devised a simpler procedure, a litmus test. Chemicals are added to a sample generating hydrogen cyanide gas, if cyanide is present. At the same time, the litmus strip, paper impregnated with a complex of chemicals, is added to the tube. If hydrogen cyanide has been produced, the strip turns purple. The degree of coloration is a rough guide to how much cyanide the sample contains. The test that uh, we currently use in this lab to screen for the presence of cyanide is very easy to do. Uh, we can do a large number of screens in a short period of time, which is a big advantage. Within days of Jennifer Meeling's near poisoning, Dr. Logan had the opportunity to try out his new tests. On February 11th and February 18th, there were two mysterious deaths. Both fell within Logan's jurisdiction. Uh, we conducted our full drug screen on the, the sample and found uh, the presence of therapeutic levels of a uh, compound called pseudoephedrine, which is the com major component of Sudafed. That in itself wasn't particularly remarkable, but uh, at the pathologist's request, we also did a, a test for cyanide. Uh, the cyanide test came back strongly positive, uh, a level that indicated uh, uh, almost a certainly the cause of death uh, as being cyanide poisoning. On March 1st, a pattern finally emerged. Three cyanide poisonings, two deaths. All three victims had taken Sudafed. Next day, Sudafed was withdrawn and the FBI was called in. Before we are, we've actually focused on Joe because that's one of the things we look at are the victim families. But uh, Joe made several comments that, that he is the primary suspect uh, and that he, he's too smart to ever be caught, and he certainly wouldn't be caught by, by the FBI. But Joe Meeling underestimated the agent's tenacity and the FBI's resources. FBI agents carefully examined the backing of the Sudafed packages in the hopes of finding some evidence of tampering. They found that on untampered packages, the foil breaks when the pill is pushed through the back leaving a jagged edge. But on the tampered packages, the break in the foil was smooth. Meeling had removed the capsules with a razor, carefully slicing them from the package so he could replace them later. Throughout the investigation, we tried to learn about nearly every aspect of Joe Meeling's life. We tried to reconstruct everything that he did for a fairly extensive time period, geographically place him into the areas of the crime scenes to find out what's making him tick, try to find the motive, how does he operate. We want to know everything about Joe Mealing. Joe and Jennifer married in 1986. From the beginning, they had quarreled, mostly about money. Jennifer took multiple jobs to make ends meet. Joe indulged his hobbies, photography, computer, and theatrical makeup. But in the days before her poisoning, Jennifer later admitted, Joe's normal behavior had changed. Five days before her collapse, Joe bought the Sudafed capsules, which neither of them had used before. When Jennifer returned home, she found Joe polishing his gram scale. Why now? He had not used it in 18 months. Stranger still, Joe was wearing latex gloves. He never cleaned the kitchen. It wasn't his job. Finally, there was the matter of the insurance policy. Joe caught Jennifer on the way to work one day and asked her to sign what she thought was a small life insurance policy for only $30,000. He knew exactly what he was doing. He asked her to sign it. When she was in a hurry, on the way out the door, she signs. And now he has a total of $700,000.
on her life. Catching poisoners is rarely quick or easy. Despite the forensic detective's arsenal of sophisticated scientific techniques, often the most important element of a successful investigation is sheer doggedness. The FBI evidence response team begins by meticulously examining a crime scene. Agents don special clothing, not to protect themselves, but to safeguard the evidence. With today's ultra-sensitive techniques, a single drop of blood or saliva, a strand of hair or scraping of skin may seal the conviction of a criminal. Careful record keeping is vital. Where each item was found, when and by whom must be documented if the evidence is to stand up in court. FBI headquarters in Washington receives so many items of evidence for testing each day, it has been given its own zip code. Fingerprints still remain among the most important clues. The FBI has more than 200 million on file. There are dozens of ways to develop otherwise invisible prints latent prints. One of the most effective is with the vapor of superglue, which adheres to the print and raises it to the surface. In the Sudafed poisoning case, Agent Turgeson and his colleagues fingerprinted every piece of evidence that might implicate Joe Meeling. Six contaminated bottles were eventually retrieved, but Joe's fingerprints could not be found. Dozens of library books were examined, again without success. Perhaps Joe remembered that fingerprints helped catch Stella Nickel, and so he wore rubber gloves. FBI agents mapped the locations where the tampered packs were found. Joe told the FBI he bought Sudafed from a store near his house. Other tampered packages turned up in a store in the Lacey area near Joe's work but four stores in Tacoma also had tampered product. Special Agent Tom Turgeson. The red dots indicate places where we could place Joe Mailing through physical evidence, through receipts, through witnesses, and other methods, place him in one store, for instance, and, and in other areas around the time frame of the tamperings and in the immediate surroundings of those stores. Joe's link to the two stores near his home and work were evident enough, but what of the four stores in Tacoma? We found out that Joe would frequent uh, the uh, stripper bars and talk to uh, the, the strippers and uh, seemingly just re relate his problems uh, to them. We found several of the uh, dancers from uh, topless dance clubs who recognized Joe Mealing, who testified against him at the trial, who placed him up here at certain uh, dates and times. Um, some of them uh, said he was a, a regular frequenter of the establishments, and they easily recognized him. The investigators had tied Joe to the tampered Sudafed packages. Could they now tie him to the cyanide? As the major suspect, the FBI tapped Joe's telephone early on in the investigation. One day, they heard him describe in vivid detail a building he had once visited. From the description, FBI agents identified it as the Emerald City Chemical Company in Kent, Washington. Among other things, Emerald City Chemicals sells cyanide. When investigators examined the poison register for the day Joe had visited the area, they could not find his signature. A Richard P. Johnson had bought cyanide that day. It was all the FBI required. As in the Stella Nickel case, handwriting analysis proved decisive. Despite Joe Meeling's attempt to disguise his handwriting, there are clear similarities between Richard P. Johnson's signature and Joe's own. Consider the formation of the J, for example, the shape of the O, and the way the letters sit upon the line. The person who signed the poison register was Joe. It was determined that Joe Mealing purchased one pound of sodium cyanide on January 11th, a pound similar to this container, which is 
a representative container of sodium cyanide in the amount of one pound. That's a lot of poison considering a pill the size of a Sudafed capsule killed two people and injured one other. One last point puzzled the investigators. When the clerk at the chemical store was shown a photograph of Joe Meeling, he failed to recognize him. In the residence of Joe Meeling, we found this array of theatrical makeup equipment. Uh, experts in theatrical makeup testified at his trial and determined on the witness stand that there is the equipment here available to make someone up to be unrecognizable as to their true identity. We found a photograph of a person who uh, looks elderly, graying hair, wrinkled face, and it's a friend of Joe Mealing in his late 20s, early 30s. It had taken 18 months of exhaustive investigation, but by August 1992, the FBI case against Joe Mealing was complete. Shortly before Jennifer's poisoning, he prepared six packages of Sudafed. In each, he replaced the Sudafed with capsules filled with lethal doses of cyanide. Five packets he returned to drugstore shelves. One remained at home to kill Jennifer. Joe Meeling was indicted on two counts of murder and the attempted murder of Jennifer Meeling. He is now serving life imprisonment. Among evidence discovered at Joe's home, agents found one last item of note, an outline for a screenplay about the poisoning of Jennifer. The protagonist, James Martin, is described as devoted, honest, reliable, sincere, truthful. Joe Mealing was greedy. Uh, he was very selfish. I don't think he was concerned about the health and welfare of his wife, Jennifer. He's concerned about Joe. Just as Stella Nichol learned from the Tylenol poisonings and Joe Meeling learned from Stella Nichol's mistakes, so too investigators learn to prevent and detect such murders. Dr. Barry Logan. There's no way to uh, to prevent a product from being tampered with. What we can do is package it in such a way that if anything is done to interfere with the material, that it's evident to the person when they buy it from the supermarket or before they uh, use the product. Well, what's important for the conviction of a poisoner are four things I call the conviction pyramid. Number one, we have to have the victim. And number two, we have to have the poisoner. And then we have to have the poison and the intent. And all these things have to be linked together. Poison to victim, poison to offender, offender to victim, and then finally, the intent. Was the intent really to kill that victim? Once you get those four things locked on, then you have the potential for a conviction. Each year, forensic science provides investigators with powerful new tools. How many poisoners still elude detection? We don't know perhaps more than we would like to admit. Who is winning the battle? In the end, no one. The fight goes on.